This week's episode of Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation Point is sponsored by Found Penny Studio. Found Penny Studio is exclusively fulfilling our Patreon Tier 3 merchandise perk by doing what they do best, creating to celebrate everyday moments like your favorite TV series. Check out Found Penny Studio's creations at foundpennystudio.com and find Couch Potatoes Unite on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash couchpotatoesunite. You say you want to watch a drama. You say you want to watch a comedy. Well, you can watch it with your mama. Or you can watch it with your daddy. You'll even sit and watch it with your middle schooler. So you can come and talk around our water cooler. We'll watch it all day and all night. Couch Potatoes Unite. Whoa, whoa. Couch Potatoes Unite. Whoa, whoa. Couch Potatoes Unite. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the podcast entitled Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point, which is based on a blog of the same name because it's clearly the future version of our past selves before our past became our future. Do you get it? Well, hopefully you will in a moment. My name is Kylie and I love TV. If you feel the same, keep listening and or checking out our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, as you're bound to find some common ground or something you like. For at Couch Potatoes Unite, we're all about the wonders and unique long-form storytelling of the small screen. CPU, exclamation point, hopes you've been following releases of brand new episodes of the podcast on Wednesdays, as well as new blog entries on some Tuesdays, and as always, we have several more new episodes on the way. Because the panels and I live lives behind our podcast, the episodes are published once per week. Subscribe to our website or the podcast via iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and on iHeartRadio and CastBox to stay on top of brand new episodes. Episodes already published discuss a variety of shows around the water cooler, including, but not limited to, Supernatural. Orange is the New Black, Gotham, The Marvel Shows on Netflix, Stranger Things, iZombie, The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, The Good Place, The Crown, Game of Thrones, American Horror Story, Grace and Frankie, and Mr. Robot. Plus, new episodes are in the works, including revisits for Altered Carbon, Doctor Who, Schitt's Creek, Westworld, Fuller House, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, Will and Grace, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. We'll be launching new panels covering The Orville, Big Little Lies, The Good Doctor, Call the Midwife, and The Animaniacs. And because we look back at shows now past, we'll travel through time and experience all sorts of identities with Quantum Leap. We'll thank the Golden Girls for being friends, and we'll cry a bazinga for Big Bang Theory. By the way, did you know that CPU also from time to time goes live? We've been live from bunkers, comedy shows, comic cons, and game stores. Plus, we're planning more live appearances and other cool stuff including in these semi-quarantine times so make sure you like or follow us at our facebook page or twitter at cpu podcast or instagram at couch potatoes unite or subscribe to the website our youtube channel our apple itunes channel our stitcher radio channel or find us on google podcast spotify Castbox, and iheart radio in the meantime you don't hear your show in this podcast format fellow panels and i still write reviews and we always seek new panelists so if you have any interest in joining the discussion say hello by finding us at any of those outlets i've mentioned at the very least, stop by and leave us a thumbs up, comment, or review. We like feedback, just don't summarily execute us after your rebellions. Diplomacy is still important, you can. Today we're around the water cooler and continuing our catch-up series centered on a multi-season historical drama based upon a series of novels of the same name by Diana Gabaldon. The show is Outlander, and this is the second of a five-part series in which CPU catches up on the series, which airs its primary run on Premium Network Stars. In this episode, part two of this series, we're discussing season two, which aired on Stars from April 9, 2016 to July 9, 2016, with a total of 13 episodes. We will discuss each subsequent available season in each new episode of this catch-up series. Developed by Ronald D. Moore, Outlander stars Catriona Balfe as Claire Randall, a married former World War II nurse who, in 1945, finds herself transported back to Scotland in 1743. There she encounters the dashing Highland warrior Jamie Fraser, played by Sam Hewen, and becomes embroiled in the Jacobite Risings. In season two, Claire and James sail to Paris to try to thwart the Jacobites by subverting the funds that King Louis the Fifteenth of France, or Louis the Fifteenth of France, is likely to provide those orchestrating the Jacobite Risings. Jamie becomes the confidant of Charles Stewart, played by Andrew Gower, but the Frasers fail to prevent the Risings. 
Captain Jonathan Blackjack Randall, played by Tobias Menzies, reappears in Paris, very much alive, but Claire makes Jamie swear to keep him that way until Frank, also played by Menzies, descent, is assured. Outlander was a show requested by a few like-minded Sassanax and some of our resident couch potatoes, namely panelists Kristen, Samantha, Lori, Karen, and Anna Laura, all of whom have reconvened around the water cooler today, ready to take on season two of this wildly romantic tale of a woman who lives her life in two different time periods attached to two different men who love her. As always, it should be noted that all of our panelists have watched all episodes of the series through season two and may discuss sensitive plot points. So for those of you who have not watched Outlander and plan to do so at some point, listen at your own risk as there may be major spoilers. Welcome back, panel. How are you? Great. Good. Wonderful. Doing good. All right. Are you ready to talk season two of this romance you all love so much? Absolutely. <laughs> of course. All right. Well, of course, we can't get too far into that discussion without checking temperatures. That's the way it works around here at Couch Potatoes Unite. What I have done is tweaked the standard CPU character question, which changes with each show we do. I've tweaked it to go along with season two, which means there's a few more characters this time because there's a lot of ton of characters in season two, as it turns out. And you get to tell us how you feel about season two along this character question. And it goes like this. Are you ready? Yep. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Great. So how would you rate your interest in the show after season two along this character question? Do you love the show, the fantasy aspects, the romance, and the appreciation and reverence for Scotland, plus the elements of action and adventure? All of it is just so exciting, even thrilling, and nothing like you've experienced before. How could something feel so timely to the future when so much of it is set in the past? Ah, you could watch this for days, you can. Plus, the leading lady isn't hard on the eyes, like James or Jamie Mackenzie Fraser. You're of two minds about this show. The past sweeps you off your feet unexpectedly, even as you yearn for more of the story set in the 1940s. It's as if you're living two lives while watching this show, an experience that is full of surprises, but also offers the occasional storytelling hiccups. Still, you will persevere, as you do with your love of the leading men, like Claire, Beauchamp, Randall, a.k.a. Fraser. The history intrigues you, the mystery entices you, but the romance frustrates you in ways you cannot fully articulate, like Frank Randall. Do you care only for the story of the main characters? You watch to learn whether Jamie and Claire's love story and their plans to change history will succeed, and you hope they do, no matter what the cost, as you're very protective of these characters and their love for each other, like Murtaugh Fraser. There are parts you like and parts you don't like, but your family watches it, so you sit down to watch with them and become involved in spite of yourself, because they are so involved and invested in the story like Janet, a.k.a. Jenny Fraser Murray and Ian Murray. Are you obsessed with this show, but the obsession is unhealthy because you dream of falling in love with Jamie Fraser, which can only be a product of your imagination, like Larry McKenzie? Did you give it a fighting chance? and You find Claire and her manner to be pure magic, but the portion of the second season set in France somewhat poisoned your ability to move forward with the series, like Master Raymond. Do you care little for the plights of the main characters? It's the supporting characters that inspire you, as well as the history behind Scotland's earnest, if ultimately failed, efforts toward independence, like Dougal Mackenzie. Are you only in it for the men in skirts, the drinking, the rabble-rousing, and the general good time? And or because most of your friends watch it, most of it just goes over your head anyway most of the time, like Rupert McKenzie or Angus Moore. Did you watch beginning with season two because you were on a mission from God? Unfortunately, you got lost pretty quickly and felt defeated too fast to stay invested beyond that, like Prince Charles Edward Stewart. Did you start watching in earnest with the start of season two and found yourself enjoying the potential of court intrigue in France mixed with the opportunity for aristocrats and royalty to achieve their selfish interests while others were devoted to national ones? It's the less obvious villains that motivate your watch most, like Clarence Marlebone, a.k.a. the Duke of Sandringham. Did you start watching in earnest somewhere in the middle of season two and became invested because of the exploration of Jamie's family history, even if you don't have a lot of loyalty to any of the characters, like Simon Fraser? Did you start watching in earnest near the end of season two and were enticed by the potential of learning the explanation for how Claire gets involved in all of this to begin with and how she comes to live two lives, including having a child with a father who lived 
200 years in the past, like Roger Wakefield and Brianna Randall. Did you enjoy the show quite a bit at first, and though you lost interest with all of the superficial exploration of pagan ritual and medieval justice, the season two premiere and Claire's return to the present, which included a future that was your past, rekindled your interest anew, so you quickly caught up with season two in order to find out what happens in season three, like Gellis Duncan, aka Gillian Edgars. Did you watch some of the show, and though it is blessed for its care for character and story development, it's not really your type of show, like Mother Hildegard. Did you only like season two and only the half set in France? You can't stand the main characters. They ruin everything for everyone like the Con Saint-Germain. That's really bad French. The Con Saint-Germain. There you go. Did you deplore the show for it does not satisfy your darkest, basest desires, which you're willing to use, whatever means necessary to fulfill? At least the English make a strong stand, and the villains keep things slightly interesting, but you're mostly too bored to muster anything more than feigned interest, like Jonathan Blackjack Randall. Now, they're not going to answer this, but I've left these two options just for the purpose. Did you stop watching because it scared you too much? You were only invested in the Randall lineage storyline anyway, like Mary Hawkins, or did you stop watching because you could no longer stay invested in the storytelling and the characters, as you didn't care too much about them anyway, and since there were less glimpses into feudal politics and related family dynamics, or because, spoiler, you died, like Colm McKenzie. Who would like to start? Hi, Kylie. It's Samantha. Hi, Samantha. <laughs> I'm so very excited to talk about this season because I'm a, I think last time I was also a half and half Jamie and Claire. I almost went full Jamie, but not quite. But I just adored this season. It was like an emotional roller coaster and I didn't expect to like it as much once they left Scotland because that was so much of what I liked about the first season, but I just loved it. All right, welcome back, Samantha. This is Karen. Hi, Karen. I would say, yeah, last time I know I was fairly split, but I think this time I'm probably 90% Jamie with about 10% of the Duke of Sandringham because I loved the French part. I think it's so interesting. That would be me. So Karen's about the court intrigue. We'll explore that in a second. Welcome back, Karen. Thanks. Lori here. Hi, Lori here. I'm still loving the show. This season breaks out some of the most beautiful costumes and some more very wonderful music. So I would go mostly with Jamie. One correction, we are not in the medieval era at this point. We are further. You had something in there about medieval. We're way past that era. It's all tongue-in-cheek in the character question, Lori. But all <laughs> right, just saying. Not going for historical accuracy there by any means. <laughs> I get it, but my medieval friends are going to be listening to this. What can I say? You can correct them as we go. Welcome back, Lori. <laughs> I am Kristen. Hi, Kristen. This time, I'm going to, oh, I got to choose a couple different characters here like I normally do if you hear me on other podcasts. For season two, I'm maybe 50% Jamie, 25% Claire, and I'm going to copy Karen. I'm a little, I'm the other 25% of the Duke of Sandringham. I ended up enjoying more of the French court intrigue more than I thought I would. So, but still, yeah, still mainly, okay, 50 Jamie, 30 Claire. 20 Duke of Sandringham. I'm going to adjust it a little bit. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> and you're going to explain what all of that percentaging me. She doesn't normally do fractions like this. So <laughs> it's, it's because I'm just that little extra bit of the Duke of Sandringham because I loved the French court part. And that was really surprising this season. Otherwise still Jamie and Claire all the way. Okay. Welcome back, Kristen. It's Anna Laura. What's up? Hi, Anna Laura. What's up? <laughs> Full name. I would say I'm mostly a Jamie with this season, and season one is still my favorite season, and it's my go-to comfort watch season, but I do love season two, and I think I do equally love the parts in France with the parts where they go back to Scotland. Like It's a pretty even love between the two halves of the season. There's interesting things happening in both places. There's a lot of fun historical events that we can visit, but then also things that are specific to just the characters and their experiences. But I would throw in like a dash of Jenny and Ian Murray, like just a little bit of the Murrays, 
because there are a couple of things that I'm not fully on board for that happen where every time I watch it, first time I watch it, when I rewatch it, I'm like, mm, okay, this is happening. But, and I'm also really here for the family parts, like whole show, the family parts. I love their dynamic. I love them so much. Welcome back, Anna Laura. <laughs> And of course, my name is Kylie. I am both moderating and participating on this panel, as is frequently 90% the case, 10% not the case. Last time, I believe I was strictly Claire for season one. I am going to actually pick two this time. I'm going to be partially Claire, partially Jamie. Of course, I'm catching, I'm literally catching up. All of these wonderful ladies have at least watched further past than I have. I'm a little into season three, but you still shouldn't spoil season three <laughs> or any of the remaining seasons. So I watched season two brand new as we're doing this catch-up series. I would say I'm half Jamie, half Claire, because there are things, there are still the things in season one translated into season two that would make me Claire. There are things that make me want more of the mystical side and the answers to the mystical side and whatever happened to the 1940s. And of course, she does eventually go back there. It's not until, spoiler, the season finale of season two. But then there is a lot of, it seems like the storytelling that they started in season one, they tighten quite a bit in season two. There is a lot more rapid pacing in season two, I think. There's not any part that drags too far, so that makes me more Jamie. And now I'm a little more invested. I really want to know what's happening. He is easy on the eyes. All of that, you know, he's easy on the eyes. She's pretty too, I guess, but I would look at Jamie. <laughs> so <laughs> all of that said, I, I don't know that I like season two more than season one per se, but I'm definitely more invested as of the end of season two and wanting to know what happens next probably more than I did after the end of season one. So welcome back, ladies. This is our all-female panel for Outlander. It just happened to be that way. <laughs> We're going to be talking about season two today and kind of breaking all of this down. We foreshadowed a little bit with our character answers, but let's start talking about it like we usually do. Tell me, what did you like or what didn't you like as much about the second season? And you can compare and contrast to the first season if you're comfortable doing that. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and start right at the beginning of season two. We open with... Claire back at Craig Dune in the 1940s and my first time watching it that threw me for the biggest loop I thought I'd clicked on the wrong episode because I'm watching it through the stars app and I I thought I jumped ahead I thought I was at the beginning of season three instead of the beginning of season two but I loved the time jump it drew me in right away even though I was super confused and I loved the little sprinkling of everything along the way of seeing her in the 1940s and you know, with Brianna and just giving us a taste of her life without actually getting to that point in the timeline where she's making that jump back. So I loved it. It was a great device. And yeah, I loved it. Opened with a bang. Definitely. That's actually what I was going to start with, too, of just they don't know that they're going to fail, but you feel that tension throughout the whole season of like, no matter how much effort you give to this, it's not going to to work so that was kind of interesting as a viewer to know that but to still forget and get really invested in all of the shenanigans of them trying to undo all of the politics and you've got Prince Charles and he's like bananas and the Frenchmen are bananas <laughs> just it, this season drew me in even more and I couldn't I didn't expect to get that any more drawn in than I already was so for it to feel deeper was bizarre but so fun oh yeah totally agree on that I think the cold open with her back in the 40s is a great way to start the season and it gives the whole season this feeling of like inevitability because like we know what's gonna happen in a sense like we've gotten a glimpse of what's gonna happen to her but we're still invested in what's happened what like how we get there because then we have to figure out, like, okay, how did that happen? Why did she go back? Because back in season one, she chose to stay in the 1700s with Jamie. So, but now now she's gone back to her own time. So we're like, wait, what? I thought we made a decision about that. Like, what are you doing? And then we have to figure it out. And like you said, like, they sprinkle in the clues, like, throughout the entire season. And then kind of concurrent with that, the kind of inevitability of these historical events where they're trying so hard 
to change things and to like avoid the Battle of Culloden or change the outcome of the Battle of Culloden, but it still happened. And she is such a fabulous actress. I mean, that first scene of her back in the future uh-huh. is so <laughs> gut wrenching. <laughs> Katrina Bell reached out of the screen, grabbed my heart out of my beating chest, and just gripped it, ripped my heart out. And not realizing that that's going to happen to you as a viewer a couple more times. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't stop there, too. It's not like the season starts off with a bang, and then it's all downhill from there. Like, it it has its highs and lows, and, like, the last couple of episodes, I remember the first time watching it, and even rewatching it, even rewatching it for this, this was, like, the third or fourth time I've watched this season, I'm still like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I know I love it too. I'm going to talk about this more when we talk about season three, but I love that they didn't spoiler show the battle of Culloden in season two. I actually forgot that on my rewatch from time one to time two. So I love that they left that out, but we knew that Jamie survived the battle that Roger let Claire and Brianna know that at the end, but I love that we don't see that in this season. I think that's another fantastic device and it gives us something to look forward to for season three. Well, and it's so reflective of her experience because she left. And she doesn't know. She didn't get to see it. Yeah, I also found it interesting that she never tried to search for Jamie either. I thought that was kind of my one, like, question moment with Claire this season is when you got back to the future, did you not even try? You just heard that the clan had all paired. Uh Because she made that promise to Frank. A bit unusual that after he died, she didn't. Other than she was so many years out from that. that There's actually some time spent on this in the season premiere where she's starting to go that route. Where she is trying to search and she's looking for things and she's talking to the reverend's housekeeper. I can't remember her name. And saying that she's looked in all of these books and she can't find any reference to the Fraser clan or the results of the Jacobite risings. But all of that is, it becomes kind of an obvious obsession, obsessive path for her. And Frank is glomming onto it and basically does say, you know, we could be together, but I can't have you, I can't have you you know, basically glued to another man in your mind while we're trying to make a life here. And that's what puts a stop to it. So I think she tries to look, but he stops it pretty quickly when they make a decision about what they're going to do together. Yeah, definitely. I understand his perspective on that, but it's still, they almost make him feel a bit heartless in that initial, at least that's how it read to me with like the burning of the dress and wanting to cut her off completely from that experience. And it could have also been she needed to put a block to that because she doesn't think she can go back. And so it was that cutoff. And wasn't didn't Frank make a fake gravestone for Jamie? Spoiler alert. <laughs> Well, see, this is where the reading the book slash the show. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. The only gravestone I remember is the one for Faith, and they go visit it at the end. <laughs> so or it's kind of in that in that pilot or pilot premiere episode. I didn't think Frank was heartless. I actually have a different take on that scene. Because he did kind of present it as, I guess, it's not so much that he presented it as anything. I think both of their positions are highly sympathetic to the audience. Because on the one hand, she's coming at this from, I'm back here, I never intended to come back here, I've lived this whole other life, I've felt these whole other feelings, and in a way maybe that she didn't really feel for Frank, which I think he realizes in the moment that she's telling him about it. At the same time, what the show presents is that she's been gone in real time for as long as she's been back in time. So Frank has been without Claire for this entire couple of years. He spent a long time looking for her, kind of gave up the search himself. So there's a bit of a parallel there as well for when he instructs her. Look, I need, you know, if you're going to be here and you're going to be here with me, I need you to, to be here with me. I don't think it's heartless. I think he's speaking from experience. And in her reaction, she's not going to hear that. She doesn't understand that or feel that in the moment because she's still reeling from the fact that she's left all this other life behind. 
but when I was watching it, I, I felt for both characters in that conversation. I really, I thought Frank was actually pretty open-minded, given the fact that she told him a tale about going back in time and all of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe heartless is the wrong word, but yeah, just the the burning and the cutoff just was like so... I did wonder why he burned the dress, because that would have been worth a lot of money. Right? <laughs> <laughs> At least sell the dress, get yourself a little nest egg, sell it to a Scottish museum, and go on your way to Boston. <laughs> so. There you go. Exactly, considering how they're living in Boston, with a stove that doesn't work, and the heat that barely works, and yeah, that might have been a nice nest egg, I agree. <laughs> Could have she would have been used to it. That's true. I eat so the, the, the fire really anyway. fireplace. Yes, that was a good scene. I enjoyed that scene when she was uh, like, "I can't do it this way, but I know how to do it this way." Do you know how to do it in the fireplace? Yep. <laughs> so that going was... back to your original question, what I liked about the French was showing the different classes, how they had to traverse all these different classes, and what's expected of them in these different classes. That was particularly well done. So many extras. So many extras. <laughs> but it was lovely to watch the difference. And Claire trying to find her path as a healer. She wanted to help the unfortunate at L'Hôpital des Anges. But she also needed to stay with Jamie. And they were committed together to work their way through the intrigues of court in all of the, the potholes that that presented so she was definitely trying to walk a thin line between two worlds in the french in the french part of the the story it was very interesting you all foreshadowed whether or not i would like the french half of this seat or french portion of this season because obviously they were heading there in the season one finale i did enjoy it quite a bit I think it was, I think they took a lot of love and care in telling us about, because this would have been not too far around the French Revolution itself as well. So there was a lot of interesting tension between the classes that they were showing between the aristocrats and the merchants and those who were vying for power, like the Comte Saint-Germain, which I thought was a very interesting and a real character that they've transposed into this story. I really enjoyed Master Raymond. I thought he was an interesting character to bring into the fold as an apothecary who also has a bit of an interest in the occult. And it's that part of the story that I, I think I'm responding to the most, the mystery around how this is all even happening to begin with. And it just feels like he was the anchor to that story this season. Plus, he was delightful, a delightful actor, and he had very good rapport and had some very well-written dialogue with Katrina Balfe. And so, I don't know, I just thought all of that was very interesting. I also thought Fergus was interesting. <laughs> I love Fergus. Fergus I love is Fergus. my fave. He's so <laughs> cute. Such, he's such, like, not like that the show was stale, but, like, he's such a breath of fresh air because like it's so hilarious watching all of these characters like these adults who are like doing all this political intrigue and they're trying to change the course of history and all this stuff and then this little kid comes through and is just being a, like a little snarky brat and they're all dealing with him he's great like comedic relief but he also he's not just comedic relief like he those relationships with Claire and Jamie and Myrta too. Like, it's really cute to see them kind of like become like a little bit, like a little found family, especially with the storyline with the pregnancy and faith. Yeah. I, I think sometimes when you introduce small children into an, a decidedly adult tale, it actually doesn't go well nine times out of 10. This time it goes very well because in some ways, since he's playing kind of the little thief who they're reforming into a spy. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> you can't be a thief, but you can be a spy. Right. <laughs> you get Acceptable career choices for you, like, you know, thir to, like, what, 12, 13-year-olds? I don't know if they well, were actually saying old years. What else do in France at that time? <laughs> yeah. What other career options were there for, you know, tweens? Exactly. So I... Your summer job is pickpocketing at a brothel. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it shows the indiv- the invisible people that really do know everything because they're ignored. And yeah. gives the audience a point of view character for really all of it, as opposed to one level versus another level. Like Fergus, or whatever his name was to begin with, I can't even remember anymore. Claudel. Claudel. There you go. He... He has a lot of sort of one-line commentary about the things that he's observing and and gathering information for. It goes beyond just report back. It's also his editorial comments, which I find to be very funny and kind of fitting in with especially Murtaugh because he also gives his editorial comments. (laughs) So when they're paired together, it's really, really funny, and it does bring some levity to an otherwise high drama season. Fergus tends to be a mirror. Yes, and how his loyalty to them builds throughout the season and how he's so protective of Claire. And when sort of Jamie leaves him in charge, almost like he would with a young son, like, okay, like, take care of the house and... You can just see his like little chest puffs up a bit and just that that pride. And the costuming was beautiful in France. She had some knockout dresses. That red dress was amazing. Oh my gosh, the red dress. Oh, I dream about having that red dress. Except you'd have to wear the things to make it work, and that would be heavy. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't that heavy. You say that, but I think I'd rather not have the things. <laughs> No, it was, it's done with bum rolls and farthingales, and it's surprisingly not that heavy. Lori, The dress material is probably heavier. Probably. Yeah, her wool would have been heavier, because she was in silk. Lori, last time did you say that there was an authentic dress in this season? Yeah, it was the mistress no. of the king. Oh, yeah. Uh, the swan dress. Yes, yes. Yeah. That, that was in the annals of history about her piercings and wearing that quite often. But she was not touched because she was the king's mistress. And I can't remember her name off the top of my head. I can't remember any other. I love that though. What is it, Madame de Montespan? I believe so. Oh, yeah. Is she the character that has the monkey? No. No, that's that's Louise. Louise. Oh, that's Louise. Okay, right. She's, She's a fictional character, but she's delightful. She's great. Which character are we talking about with this dress? I guess that's not ringing a bell. You really don't, she doesn't really talk. She just shows up at a party in this dress that's incredibly revealing. And it's just pointed out that that is the king's mistress, Madame de Montespan. Yeah. So, and that's a historically accurate dress. That in in the Bridge Post. Fair enough. If they don't talk, I'm less likely to remember it. I guess the dress didn't make a splash with me. Or maybe I was uh, just sensory overload at that party. So. It is, there is a lot happening at that party. I love that little touch, though, not just because it's like a nod to like a real thing in history, like a funny to me thing in history. But like, I love that because you have the whole scene where they're at their house and she comes down the stairs in her red dress and it's this big moment. And then Jamie is like, what are you doing? Like, you're barely covered because she has this plunging neckline. And she's like, what? It's fine. Like, it's fashion. Look it up. Well, and he's face face like, think like, and she's expecting a compliment because I think she thinks yeah. it's great. Which she yeah, she, and she and, does. And he looks she's, surprised and you almost expect him to be like, wow, you look amazing. And then when he doesn't, it's like, what's wrong with like, excuse you. That was not the right reaction here like try again but he like he like he was like okay like he's like oh my gosh like you're barely covered and she's like i wear what i want deal with it you've got a you've got a hot wife like sorry but he's like you know oh like you're barely covered and then all that stuff and then they go to this party and this woman's walking around with like her whole tit out like, <laughs> i'm like <laughs> Well, and I love how in that staircase scene, how Murtaugh's like, whatever. Like, yeah, he does not like, care. He's right. like, can we get this over with, please? I want his boots, though. Those boots are gorgeous that he wears Aren't in this they? season. Oh, they're gorgeous. A lot of his costumes are really quite nice. The lovely embroidered waistcoats and things. There was some high attention to detail in this season. Not only in costuming, but also in art direction. Like, I thought they made really good use of 
especially of the estate that they were living in, his cousin's estate. I thought that was just a beautiful, probably three room set that they built just for this and how they made good use of it. They did a lot. I wonder, I didn't look this up before we were recording, but they did they do anything on location in France? Does anybody know? I think it was, I believe so. External shots. Most of it was shot, I think, in Croatia. Okay. The internal, the individual houses, the landmark shots, things like Versailles and were shot in France, but a lot of the inside shots were done in, I believe, Croatia. Okay, cool. I'm going to ask, because I don't remember if this happened in the TV show, when they did The Nun, Saint Mother Hildegard, Mother Hildegard, did they do the, the bit with the dog? Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. That, too, was historically accurate. That, yes. that, too, is written down that that did happen, that that dog could sense cancer. I love all of these historically accurate things, because, like, when you think, like, oh, this show is historically accurate, like, you always think it's the boring stuff, like, this battle happened, or this person was real, and, like, yes, we have that, but we also have a woman walking around topless and a cancer-sniffing dog. Like, <laughs> there's parts of the show that you wouldn't think are accurate. Like, the parts of the show that feel like something an author or a uh, writer or whoever, like, would come up with are, like, the real thing. And same thing at L'Hôpital des Anges. The volunteer physicians were, like, butchers and the executioner who had extra time and they used it to further their education but also to provide what help they could to the poor and unfortunate ill and they used real very interesting methods that are real historical methods your analysis testing has been done by taste for centuries before we ever had chemicals to detect diabetes so you know things like that were very cool that they kept those little bitty truthful elements and interestingly the character of mother hildegard although she is officially a fictional character is loosely based on hildegard von bingen from the 11th century who was a famous holy woman mystic from germany who wrote music at lots and lots of music and was a philosopher and pushed for women's rights. I mean, she was, she's an amazing lady, but they just basically, the Diana Gabaldon basically picked her up out of history and just moved her up a few centuries and found <laughs> a good place for her. But all of her characterization and the things she did are actually things that Hildegard von Bingen did several centuries earlier. It's interesting that this Hildegard is well acquainted with or related to Johann Sebastian Bach. I thought that was a fun little touch that they, because I yes. spent my childhood growing up playing the violin. It's not something I do right now. I regret it. I miss it. But in the, in the terms of loving classical music, I thought, oh, well, that was a cute little touch that they threw in there. And the selection of music that they actually threw in there with trying to decipher the code and things, so. Yeah. I have one little correction. So, for the filming production, some of the interiors were filmed in the sound stages in Scotland, like they did with season one. Other interiors were shot in some palaces in the south of England that had French rooms and architecture. And then for the exterior scenes, they were shot in Prague. Not oh, Prague. thank you. That's right. Yeah, but yeah, everything, yeah, so they stayed pretty much within England and Scotland and then a little bit to Prague for exterior street scenes. And then the Palace of Versailles was also in Prague. Oh, yeah, it looked kind of similar. They did a good job. <laughs> so. Yeah, they did a really good job. Yeah. They probably couldn't get into Versailles, so they had to find <laughs> something that was close. Yeah. <laughs> I dream of going there to France. Oh, it's not that fabulous. I've been there. It's kind of dreary and overcrowded. Oh, uh, don't burst my bubble. Uh, I'm someday, sorry. I her dream. Bubble too. Someday, <laughs> her dream. Yeah, someday when we're allowed to go places again and it's not pandemical, keep hope alive. I'm going to go back to Europe and go to the places that I haven't been and go back to the places that I have been. That's my dream. 
And I have never been to Scotland, even though there's quite a lot of Scottish in my genetics, so I'd like to go there. I'm all inspired because of the show now, <laughs> so don't burst my I bone. know. <laughs> hey, they have tours. You can take vacations, and they you can do an Outlander tour. All right. Yeah. I'll do it. And go up to all these places. Cool. Fort William and, yeah, all those cool places. Castle so Stewart. Cool. Culloden is something else, though. When you go out on that field, it, it's kind of like going to Gettysburg. Oh, wow. To just see the, the stones that they erected for where the clans died. It's eerie. And, it, and the day I was there, of course, there was mist on the ground, so it added a whole new level of eeriness. But it's an interesting, like Gettysburg, I guess, is the, the American version or something similar. Yeah, and they did actually shoot on the field, which I thought was a really nice touch that they were able to do that, too. Probably jumped through a lot of hoops to do that. Well, I think Scotland was ecstatic to have something so well acclaimed being filmed in Scotland with, I think they're getting a lot of exposure. With a oh, yeah. largely Scottish cast. I mean, the, the people who are playing Scottish people are Scotsmen and women themselves. Which is wonderful. So we've talked quite a bit about France, and we can we can move forward in this season. But was there? I feel like it is two different seasons within one season because there yeah. is definitely we're in France now, and then without seeing the trip, we're in Scotland now. And there's two different theme songs when they go back to Scotland, and I love that yeah. note too. The changing of the themes. The theme song is very haunting in all of its different versions, I have to say. I find myself humming it when I'm watching the show. I'm humming it later on in the day, and I love the different touches. Even if they don't change the words, they change the style of instrumentation <laughs> underneath. And just the amount of work they put into the credits, I've noticed that every scene where there's based on the book directed by is a foreshadowing bit of each of the episodes which i don't think we talked much about last time i noticed it more this time probably because of the variety of settings and locales that we got so i was like well that wow they must like have put some of money detail. in it. yeah lots of level of detail there very interesting and fun to watch because you're like "Ooh, what does this mean i'm very excited to know <laughs> so I love the credits that they keep the same from location to location or even season to or season to season. They have, you know, the close-up of Claire's feet running from season one is always there. And, you know, the the women dancing at Craig Nadoon from season one is always there. I just I love that they have things that stay the same. Yeah. So let's let's treat this these two halves as two different seasons. Was there anything about France that you didn't like as much, or is there anything that you really want to focus in on. One of the things I think I want to mention that it's not that I like or don't like it is the fact that they find out that Blackjack is alive still. Which of course we knew. We knew that. I mean you all knew that but I knew that going in five and watched it the first time. I was like of course he's still alive. I just need to know how the heck he's still alive. I don't know that they really explained that in the second season but. It's the Murdoch of this show. If that reference means anything. <laughs> 18. The, the Emperor <laughs> Palpatine. <laughs> Some, somehow Palpatine is back. We went from the A-Team to the Star Wars sequels. I don't know how I feel. <laughs> and I wasn't referencing either one of those. I was referencing MacGyver. <laughs> so Obviously funny. I can't be in charge of any references. <laughs> It's fine. It just means they're all open to interpretation and everybody relates to it differently. <laughs> so in the book, they do explain in detail how he makes it, how Blackjack makes it. And I'll leave it at that because I don't want to spoil it do any show, further. People want to read it. Do they show it later in the series? Or I don't think so. Okay. You'll get an explanation in season three. You'll get closure in season three. But no, they never actually explain. In season two, there's like one scene. Like it's just like a flashback that shows what happened. The, the, the stampede with the cows. But they never actually explain how he survived it no and that i think was one of the storytelling missteps for me in season two because i was like 
it was he made a great it made a great impact when Claire learns from his brother who shows up and is dating dating is see is copulating <laughs> <laughs> going steady I don't know what the term would be well <laughs> wooing Wooing, yes, courting. <laughs> yeah, there we go. One of the words that refers to relationships in this century with Mary and Claire sees him at this party and he mentions just very offhandedly that he's received this note from his brother. And I love the play and the and the sort of the direction on that where the music gets very sinister and her face falls and she kind of gets really pale. And she's like, oh no, I got to tell Jamie. And then she doesn't tell Jamie for a long time because she knows exactly how he'll react, which he then reacts exactly how she expected. So that's all very good. And the way it feels is very organic. My only thing was where we left Blackjack in season one compared to where we get to in season two, I felt that that was a hole they could have filled a little bit better. Especially when he's so prominent. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I kind of like that he was just like, oh, had there was an incident. And it's just this sort of unspoken thing between them because she knows how he got run over by the stampede. But he's making it sound like it was part of some heroic action or military action. I don't know if he thinks of anything heroic. <laughs> A very British thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Admittedly. It was sort of left dangling, I agree. I mean, he's just so, he's so imposing, and when he comes back, he comes back with a vengeance, which we can talk about here. I guess we'll talk about it here. The scene with Fergus was even more deplorable uh, than the scene with Jamie. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, I kept wondering to myself, man, that Tobias Menzies, like, how did he find the chutzpah to do that scene of all the scenes? Because that one's tough. That one is really, really tough. And it just, it feels like, yes, okay, him presenting to the other characters stiff, upper lipish, heroic act, okay. But we know what really happened, except for how he got out of it. So I just feel like they could have told us somewhere. Yeah, I feel like that information like, could be revealed. It's, I'm not expecting, like, an explanation as soon as we find out that he's still alive. Like, I don't need all the answers right now. Like, definitely do the whole, like, planting and payoff storytelling, revealing things as they naturally come thing. But, like, yeah, it would have been nice to know. (laughs) Would have been good to have, like, some sort of answer. I mean, the man has a lot of grit and a lot of drive for somebody who is so dark. He doesn't seem to have any specific ambition except to fulfill his darkest urges. So it it would be an interesting story to, to try to figure out wanting to survive a stampede just so he could go back to these baser urges, I guess. Well, yeah. but, no, I actually disagree. He has ambition. He wants to climb up the ladder, but he doesn't want to get caught with his base urges. And that's why he wants to take Jamie out, because if he the higher-ups hear about that, he's going to get ousted and thrown on the street, if not killed. So there, there, there is, I got to remember, where does the season end with his brother, Alexander? He dies by the I, end of the season. Okay, so, and he's also driven to support his brother. Yeah. Which you do find that out, so that's, if that's what, if that's the explanation we're supposed to take away for why he, or how he able, was able to emerge from stamp being stampeded, I don't even know how you say that, that's fine. I agree with you, Lori, to an extent, but I don't think that's his primary thing at all with Jamie. I think that's oversimplifying his need to conquer Jamie. Because I think Jamie is more complicated than I'm going to offer up this huge Scottish rebel to my superiors and be rewarded for that, but for the fact that I might be found out. I think with Jamie, it's about conquering somebody who is strong. Never said he loved him. No, never said he loved that, him. That's what he wants. Right. Somebody From Jamie. Right. He can't break him completely. He wants to break him, and he wants to be reciprocated in that attraction that he clearly has, but he can't, but it becomes this character's need to like conquer Jamie's 
piece of that and sort of make him submit. I think that's very clear in the season one episodes that focus on his time in prison. I don't think it's just about gaining power. That's part of it. That's bonus. It's, you know, he wants to ensure himself and his future and the future of his family for sure. But I think it's much more complicated with Jamie, which is why when it's so rich with Black Jack, he's a very unique villain that I've seen on TV, even on things like the premium stations. You don't often see somebody so dark where you don't have to show everything, but you show enough and you get the picture. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just felt like a little bit of, okay, you could have spent a little more time here and maybe less time worrying about who you're going to talk to next to try to get the money swayed away from the rebellion. Personal opinion. I read, read the book. More episodes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, see, that's how, because he is very tender with his brother Alexander. You know, you see that a little bit, maybe not as much in the TV show, but you're right. He definitely is obsessed with Jamie, not going to deny that at all about the conquering, but he's also driven to kiss up to the Duke. That's the guy that was in Four Weddings and a Funeral. <laughs> Never seen that. Yep. Oh, right. Yeah, he's been in everything. He's like British character actor extraordinaire. Usually Love plays him. somebody who's a little bit funny, clownish in his presentation, which I would argue the Duke is. He's kind of a ga you know, a gallant who has a little bit of that foppish <laughs> approach to life. <laughs> <laughs> Samantha, what did you say earlier when Lori and I were discussing this heavily <laughs> about the <laughs> Oh, goodness. I don't remember now. <laughs> well, I know that's one of my favorite episodes is the one where, admittedly, the way they got there was contrived. But in the book, the episode of Murtaugh and Jamie coming to rescue Claire at Sandringham's palace and Sandringham getting his commitments... It was very, like, horror movie-ish. Yeah. And, and again, Murtaugh is so like, yeah, whatever, of course I just did this and it's no big deal. Which is actually one of my favorite moments of the whole season is when Claire's like, okay, you need to tell him. And the two of them kind of, and you know, they're out in the courtyard and going round and round and thankfully they don't make us listen to the whole thing. But just at the end, it's like just sock him and be like, you should have just told me that. And it's like such an embodiment of his character. I'm not going to lie. Murta is one of my favorite characters. Oh, oh yeah. I adore him. He's a good one. I love him because he, he's the character that says like it is or how it needs to be said in the moment. Other than Jenny, Jenny fulfills that role too. But Murta's there mostly. So, and he's just so funny. I, I enjoy him so much. And he clearly and, loves them both, so he does it with affection, but he's, you know. Right. <laughs> Going to the horror part. Yeah. The Hellfire Club, period, and it was all about the occult and sex and drinking. So they, they put a little bit of the Hellfire Club in there. Well, it's France. Well, actually, the Hellfire Club was all over the world. Oh. Mostly England. Ooh, I guess it was the Illuminati circa that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, the Illuminati. <laughs> Either way, a good that secret society. Too is, is all over in there, too. Are we going to talk about the Bonnie Prince? He's bananas. That's all you need to say. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> but such a good actor to, to yes. play someone that unhinged and to, to watch him, like, draw it in and, like, he makes sense one sentence and then two sentences later, he, it's like, man, you are off your rocker. He's a very interesting character because... Clearly, he's held in some regard in Scottish culture because he was ready to make this step on their behalf and reclaim the throne for the Stuarts. But the way this guy played him, unhinged is a good word. I like it. He, he plays... Oh, it's hilariously unhinged. Yeah, he plays the edge, though, very, very well, where he never quite steps over the line. It's yeah. always very calm but very unsettling that he's yeah. so pure With of purpose and truly convinced this is his holy mission. He's on oh, a yeah. mission from God. That's why I did that quote, Blues Brothers reference. There you go. There <laughs> you go. And I just, every time he's like, mark me, mark me. And you can see <laughs> in Jamie's reaction to him as the season progresses, how he's just like, dude. And do you notice that as mark me comes with a hand to the face of whomever he's telling to mark him, I thought that was yeah. a really interesting touch. Yes. 
the inflection of it, I think, is so interesting. And it it changes as the season progresses, too, as they get more towards, like, the doomsday. But not... It changes... His voice goes up. He knows that things are going to go badly. Like, he becomes more convinced they're going to go well. Very subtle in his changes throughout, but his voice does go up on the mark me to the more panic. And the other thing about that I loved is that total disconnect of royalty of what's really happening. He's living in that fantasy world that, yep. you know, he thinks he knows, but really doesn't. And shopping for answers from his different consultants, whether it be his general that has served him for X amount of years, to Jamie, who he just knows is really, really loyal, but if he doesn't get the answer he wants, he goes to the other guy, basically, which I think is fun. A wonderful actor. Oh, yeah. He plays, like you were saying, he plays that line perfectly, and what I really loved is that he He's not a caricature. He's not a buffoon. Like, it's not too much. Like, it feels... It's it's just enough of, like, okay, maybe this guy isn't that great of a leader. Like, maybe he's not the perfect person to be leading this rebellion. Or maybe even, like, a good choice for a person to be leading this rebellion. Like, maybe... Maybe this isn't gonna go as well as we thought it was gonna be. Because like they go to France and they're like, we're gonna we're gonna do this. We're gonna talk to Bonnie Prince Charlie. We're gonna get this done. We're gonna change history. And they get there and they're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But he's not. But he's not like he's not being like too silly or like for for the tone of the show, he's not being like too silly or too crazy. I mean, the wild, weird things happen in this show. And like I said at the big at the beginning there are a couple of things where i'm like really okay this is what's happening but like i never felt that way with bonnie french charlie it wasn't him and it made me think not necessarily about this because who knows you know unless you were there you don't know but how he's presented in the museum when claire goes back Mm -hmm. to Scotland versus (laughs) what she experienced in reality it made me think like how much of history is like that where, you know, the more time progresses, the more it gets twisted and how people view certain historical figures, you know, kind of up on a pedestal. It made me wonder how much research Diana did for the novels on this figure and what made her, what informed her choice to tell this, and he may very well have been this way, there might be all sorts of historical references, this is not going to be my specialty, So what did she assemble that made her create this characterization of this figure in her novels, which then translates to screen here? Exactly. I'm interested. I'd love to know that process. She'd be a great person to talk to, because clearly she's got a very good grasp of everything that is the setting of her novels, and therefore the TV shows, and I just, I kind of want to know what her process was, what inspired her to write these books, how she did her research for these books. I think it would be a really great talk, and maybe that's one she's given three times already. I just haven't seen it yet, but I'd love to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love, just kind of going back to what Samantha said, I love when Claire's in the museum and they have the the wax statue of the Bonnie Prince and she makes some offhanded remark about how he wasn't that tall in real life or something silly. I don't know, just that those little interjections of humor that they have as little asides are just wonderful in this show. The, the writers, that's one of their moments where they really shine. Fergus has a lot of those too. Especially when she's in the 60s era and after she, so in the 1900s, after she comes back, where she's a much more buttoned up and controlling the emotions, closed off. But then you get those little like nugget one-liners that let you know that like, okay, her personality is still in there somewhere. She's not completely shut down. And you would think she'd be more shut down in the 1700s versus the 1960s. I think that's something to be noted. That is an interesting little reversal, isn't it? Although she tries, but that's, I think that's more into season three. So we, <laughs> I did watch a few episodes into season three, so I know some of where it goes. But let's, so is there anything that you liked or didn't like about France that we haven't talked about yet? Because now I feel like we should follow the show to scotland one last thing for me actually it's funny because the episode Faye is one of my favorite episodes of the entire series and also the season but it also has one of the scenes or sequences i guess you could say that i hate the most (laughs) so it's weird it's it's always because again like 
Katrina Bell just acts her socks off in that episode. It's so good because Claire goes through so much in just within that episode. And I really appreciated the fact that like they talk about miscarriage. They talk about what it's like to go through that. And not only does she have to deal with the loss of her child after she struggled with infertility, after she thought she couldn't have kids, and then she loses her child, she has to do that without Jamie there to support her they can't process that together until you know a little bit later she has to go through that on her own but also I just really it's one of those things where when when she goes and she goes to petition the king to get Jamie out of prison and she like submits to him sexually I hate that trope so much anytime that happens in anything I hate it so much It's weird because, like, that sequence, like, production design, the costume design is amazing. The whole thing with the Comte Saint-Germain and all that, where they do the poison, like, the that room. Stone change. Uh. Yeah, you see the stone change? The first time I saw the stone stone change, I was like, oh, Lord. But I was like, okay, what's happening? I don't, but what I don't like about that scene is that they do that fake out where you're like, okay, the favor is going to be you know, find the rat, use your, you know, Madame Blanche powers to do me this favor. But then he, then all that's over. And then he's like, oh, you still have to have sex with me. I was like, she just had a miscarriage, dude. Like she's already dealing with so much trauma. And I hate that because they don't really like make the king out to be that kind of person. I feel like it comes out of nowhere. It didn't feel necessary to me. Like, it felt like they're throwing that in, and I guess this is foreshadowing for some of my feelings for some of the things that happen later in the series, where there are just, there are traumatic events that don't feel necessary to the story, and I don't like that. So I'm going to hit it from the historical side. That's how you got anything done with the kings and queens. You had to sleep with them or be there in the bathroom with them or be at the birthing. All that got you what you wanted. Very historically accurate. And I, I'm not arguing with the fact that it happened. I'm just saying from a storytelling aspect. And I, and again, I'm looking at this through the lens of I've watched. I'm, I'm up to date with the entire series. And as I said, I think this becomes more and more of a problem later on in later episodes and later seasons. There's just a lot. It's like they pile on the trauma for these characters. And there's only so much trauma that I feel like is good for the story. Like, obviously, there has to be conflict. Obviously, there has to be adversity for these characters. Otherwise, the show's going to not be interesting. But I feel like there are some parts where it would... You could rein it in a little bit. Well, I want you to put a button on that because for the first time watcher, which is me, I was not shocked by Lori's right. I mean, that's that's what happened. And it is it is meant to sock you in the gut in the moment that you're watching it because she did go through this whole whole rigmarole in this occult based room trying to suss out who's doing what and pretending she's magical just to find you know hopefully get Jamie out of the bestie but this is also the same family of monarchs that eventually gets beheaded because they have very lush and voracious appetites for a lot of things, including sex. And so the mm-hmm. fact that they leave the room and that's basically what he says, drop your pants, we're doing this now, and then I'll let your husband out of jail. I mean, that didn't surprise me. And the fact that I actually didn't think it was overplayed or overwrought in the moment. It was very by the you know direct on his part. We're doing this. Let's go. She, of course, is very disappointed, and you see that trauma on her face, and that's why you sympathize with her, because you know she's had a miscarriage, and you just watch this whole circus play out. But he didn't. He's just a spoiled aristocrat in 18th century France doing what he knows he can do because he can do it. So. Goes to the lengths that Jamie went to to free her. This is what she has to do to free him. Exactly. There's a lot of parallelism which Lori's pointing out, and I think that's pretty mm-hmm. cool. And it actually gives me more respect for the show because <laughs> I'm going through well, like first time reactions and I'm not noticing all this. <laughs> so you you definitely notice it upon rewatch. I mean, one thing that I I think I noticed it like the first or second time that I watched it, but I must have like forgotten about it or something but when I watched it this past time to get ready for this recording when she in in the episode Faith where she wakes up after the miscarriage and she's saying my baby where's my baby I want my baby and she wants to hold her and all that stuff 
but then later on when she has free and she wakes up and the same thing you know when some when you go through that kind of thing it stays with you and yeah but like I said I'm really glad that they talked about that that they included that because that's something that way more women than you would think go through but it's something that doesn't get talked about especially from Claire's point of view coming from a century where more babies survived than not Mm -hmm. would be extra traumatizing because she she knows that medically maybe in the 60s something could have happened where she wouldn't have lost the baby yes it's a great episode of talking about miscarriage well i think it is also one of the best episodes of the season It, it was it was a big emotional roller coaster. There was a lot happening in yeah. that episode. Even even with the things about it where I don't, you know, like I said, I don't love that all of that happened. But if it had to happen, I think it was done as well as it could possibly be. And I, I think a lot of that is due to the performances and especially Katrina. Because she, there's some really wild, crazy things happening in this episode but she grounds it and she makes you feel along with Claire what she's going through. It feels about as real as it could possibly feel because she's, she's so obviously invested and you see how much these characters care about each other. When she comes back to the house and the whole household comes out and it's like, well, and it's like bringing her back home and she's like crying. Like I cry every time. It gets me. It's jam packed for sure. Oh sure. yeah. And definitely felt like a really great, it was almost like the first climax of the season. Like it had been building up yeah. to this gigantic moment here and then they make the decision to go home. So that's actually a very good segue. Now let's go to Scotland. Can, can I say one more thing about that? I don't know how many people realize where she gets buried is traumatizing in itself because she couldn't be buried on holy ground because she was never baptized. There, That is a key point for both of them in terms of what they had to do to bury her. Mother Hildegard christens her anyways even though she was born dead exactly where she wasn't supposed to do that but she does that anyways that shows how much mother hildegard cares about claire is that she's willing to break that rule to to christen faith and so she can be buried and it's those little pieces of woman power that people maybe in today's era don't under don't get fully about the breaking of those tiny rules Women helping women, we love to see it. I'm really fascinated to learn more about the real life inspiration for Mother Hildegard because I also enjoyed that character quite a bit, and I love love learning that from Karen today. I'm actually probably going to take some time to go research that real life Hildegard and and learn more about her because just very cool, very cool addition to this season, and just right along with Claire trying to find her way and her purpose in a society that by all rights and means maybe she shouldn't fit into because she is so outspoken and so 20th century but finds a way anyway because she's got her wits about her and she finds support in people like mother hildegard but the trauma as anna has as referred to was deep enough and they were realizing that their efforts to deter the jacobite uprising uprising quote unquote was not going quite so well in France and in fact it was starting to feel inevitable enough to them that they decided to go back to Scotland and do what they could do to maybe raise the possibility of success for the Jacobites although we all knew the inevitability was starting to now careen toward its inevitable conclusion. So we go back to Scotland they start back at what's the name of the estate again? Leoc. Yes. What? Leoc. Castle Leoc. Castle Leoc. The house of the Fraser clan, right? No. Yeah. No. Mackenzie. That's Bowley. Lollybrook. Oh my gosh. There's too many L locks. Lollybrook. Lollybrook is the okay. Murrays. And Lollybrook is the Murrays. Leoc is the Mackenzie's. Yep. Correct. And Fraser of Lovett is that Bowley. What a great character, but every time he comes on screen, I want to punch him in the face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> oh, Grandpa! Yeah, sexist Grandpa. grandpa. Yeah, right. 
<laughs> the Sly Fox. The Sly Fox. It was based on a real guy. That real guy character. Is real. So let's talk about all this because they do come back. They start off at Lollybrook. That's the one I was going for. <laughs> Where Jenny and Ian are kind of holding court and just really this last half of the season is all about making sure that they get enough people to actually be well trained and fight this rebellion and hopefully win even though the British are already starting to close in around them that's basically where we find them when all of this begins so talk about this part of the season what did you like what didn't you like huh? something that's small for me it's a small thing but like when they go back to Lollybrook they are like harvesting potatoes and Jenny's like, oh, Claire, I'm so glad you told us to plant these because like it's a great crop. We love it. And I but I, it's a little thing. But I think that shows how much Claire is thinking about making sure they're taken care of and knowing that, you know, even if they're going to pursue this kind of doomed cause, like. Lallybrook and all the people who belong to it are going to be taken care of. They're going to be kept safe. And later in the season where they decide to make over Lallybrook to young Jamie to safeguard it. Because there's this, there's this kind of dual goal, I think, for them of taking care of Scotland, taking care of their country, and making things better for the Scottish people as a whole, but especially for the people that they care about personally and the people who, you know, whose safety they're responsible for. I think that is like a really, it's, it's smaller, but I think it's a really, really cool thing that they put in there to show that. Definitely. And the acceleration of the, I guess, would they be flashbacks or flash forwards? especially in the finale, as yeah. the war is progressing, and you can, it almost accelerates that callback of knowing that she's going to end up in the future again, and being like, no matter what happens, she's being pulled forward. And you can see how things don't necessarily go so great. Like, I think in Jamie's mind, he's he thinks he's sending her to, like, an odyssey or something. Like, he has a very idyllic view of what the future is and, and how she's going to be living when she gets back, and that's just not reality. Everybody got more quiet around the Scotland piece. It's just so <laughs> dramatic, Kylie. <laughs> it's a lot of war and death. Honestly, I love some of the Scottish part. I love the fact that they go and talk to this very real historic character who is Jamie's grandfather, Fraser of Clan Lovett. He was such a double dealer. He was such a, a mover and shaker in those times. He wanted to come up on the right end of the law. And he ended up losing his head at the Tower of London because he tried too hard to play both sides. But his son, Simon Levitt, Simon Fraser, actually ended up, was the young man who went with Jamie with the forces to go to battle. He was the one that brought those men for Jamie and, and Dougal to train. But he's also a real history historical character he became a magnificent revolutionary war general if you look ahead in history he becomes a huge factor in america as well but simon fraser the junior ends up being a a big character in history so i think that you know i don't like the old fox personally i think he's just a double dealer and an ugly man but the fact that he's there and they're talking through him and all this is very historically accurate, I liked. The other thing I love, you know, one of the questions you asked, Kylie, was, you know, is there a scene that you think was particularly well done? I absolutely, absolutely love the shot on the moors at Preston Pans of the Scott forces coming out of the fog, screaming their heads off like a bunch of banshees. I love that. I love that shot. I just think it's so incredibly well done. So a couple of my favorite parts is dealing with Column again, coming back around that, because Column knows his days are numbered with his disease. Doesn't know what his disease really is, but he knows his days are numbered. And the introduction of Alexander Randall and how they all want to hate him but they actually like the poor guy. But he's the opposite of his brother, really. Yeah, and the way that works out, I, I thought that was a very nice tie-in to how 
Frank Randall ultimately becomes his his lineage becomes something because of what Jamie did to Black Jack, making him incapable of ever fathering a child. But the fact that Alex and Mary have fallen in love and Black Jack actually ends up taking care of her. Yeah, that's kind of a cool tie-in. And there will be another parallel in future seasons of somebody else. I won't give that away, but there will be another parallel. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's my favorite part of the Scotland half of the season is the exploration of all the different lineages. You get with the Fox character, the old Fox, you get to see and learn about Jamie's various, the Fraser side of his family, basically, rather than the Mackenzie side of his family. Because we spent all that time with the Mackenzies in, in the first season, now we get to learn about the Frasers. I like that it's, it's interesting to me that both Clan Mackenzie and Colum are so interested in Jamie kind of being a succeeding force for him, whereas Simon wants him to be a succeeding force for him. It's a very interesting sort of sense of fate and destiny around Jamie, which goes into my wildly romantic fantasy stuff that I'm like, why, why Jamie? Why does he have all of this <laughs> star shining on him right now besides being so hunky? And he's so hunky with this fabulous red hair that everybody keeps talking about but <laughs> it's, it's, and it, it's because jamie is so intelligent and gets all these manipulations and he can keep it all in his head who's friends with who what should we do here plus the added knowledge he knows claude's gonna fail right. so he's trying to do damage control of his own family and trying not to draw in and sever well draw in the family but also sever ties sure of course that's all part of it i guess i'm more looking at the how he all, how he gets to be at the point where he gets all that and knows all that and look at all of the different ancestors that we're meeting and and family that we're meeting and how they all interplay around him which i think it's just it's fun to watch i think that's one of the best parts of the show for me is kind of watching how they they do take care to tie future to past and past to future and the stuff around frank and blackjack and alex and mary i thought that was very interesting as well although it's still very curious to me that frank looks so much like blackjack <laughs> that's all genetics i guess in the fairy tale world but it's it's funny to me that you know that's what happens after all of that but I also agree, Karen, the, the direction around all of the different battles leading up to Culloden, because like Kristen said, we don't actually see, we see the start, the, the ready for Culloden, but it cuts at that point and goes to a different part in the season finale in the future. We don't get to see everything. So everything in Preston Pans and just the sort of intrigue around just getting ready for this battle, I think everything is shot really, really well. And I like the fact that they've taken the locations and really drummed them up with the addition of mists and the different weather changes and stuff like that that's in that area. They really add a lot to it that it just makes it feel visceral. And it really happens that way. When you're over there, the mists will just come in out of nowhere and then they'll just leave. Yeah. It's actually quite fascinating. Haven't been to Scotland, but have I told you my Stonehenge story? I will do that offline. But I literally experienced four changes of weather walking around Stonehenge in an hour's time. <laughs> so, <laughs> and there was a rainbow over the horizon at one point. Lots of sheep. And then no cloud in the sky. It was crazy. And then it was raining again by the time I got back. It was just a whole thing. <laughs> so, But Kylie, did you touch one of the stones and get thrown back in time? That's a real question we need to ask here. Is Stonehenge related to Craig Nadoon? Because that didn't work for me. <laughs> so, it's a standing circle. <laughs> it is a standing circle. Maybe they have different magical properties, though. We don't know. <laughs> You're just there on an off day. That's all. Oh, well, damn. <laughs> Gotta be around the solstices and the... Yeah, it was, it was like not even... Or it might have been just past the first day of spring or just before the first day of spring. It was March. That's all I remember. Almost 20 years ago. Oh, jeez. Oh, <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, so do you guys agree with her doing what she did to Colm? Yes. Yes. 
But that gets us into a very political debate. Well, and it still is a political yeah. debate. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, let's tread tread lightly. <laughs> right. And it's, but I think it needs to be, we've talked about other sensitive subjects. Here's yet another sensitive subjects dealt with. Yeah. No, she gave him the choice. Yeah. It was his choice. It was his choice, and I think the way they shot it, I love how they juxtapose Dougal and Colm, and how we get this whole bedside scene, which is actually somewhat vulnerable for Dougal, but at the same time, not more than a few characters accuse Dougal of being kind of a narcissist, which I think is funny, and you kind of, you are sympathetic to him to think, well, maybe you're not really a narcissist. You are, as you say, you just care so much about Scotland and your family and you just want everything to go well. But then in the moment that he's sitting by Colm's bedside and realized that he had this medicine, if you will, that allowed him to, to pass peacefully. And he says, you did that just to spite me. This was all about me. I'm like, well, maybe all the other people are right, Dougal McKenzie. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they have a point. Such a tremendous actor, the progression of just sitting by his bedside and really acting to nothing. Just incredible. And how this show has landed so many amazing people. I it's love just Graham great. McTavish, who plays Dougal. I really love him. He's oh yeah, he's really good. He he's crapped in a few things too. Yeah, the actor who played Colum too. Yeah. That was just a masterful performance. So I don't know if I agree with it or do, I think it's it was his choice. And for the story, I was fine. You know, I was along for the ride. He was clearly suffering clearly deteriorating and it made use of Claire's you know she's really developed quite a large knowledge of herbs and plants and medicinal properties of the nature around her and also learns more from Master Raymond while she's in France so that was kind of a nice progression there and I just I accepted it as part of the story I was like okay yeah that be, that makes a lot of sense plus Claire at that time is still 1940s Claire without her medical knowledge of later, the end of the series. So we, at the, the end of the season, so we don't know whether she would have done it 20 years later. Yeah. She might not have. But she, we also know that here, here in the here and now, she was still the wartime nurse. And it was interesting that yeah. in this season, they have the flashback of her when she was actually in World War Two, kind of yeah. the Preston Pans and the different skirmishes in Scotland triggering sort of this PTSD for her from World War, sorry, World War, yeah, World War Two. Mm. starting to get my World Wars mixed up. So that also kind of plays into this scene a little bit because she, she sees the mercy that she's providing for him in ways that she did for the soldiers that she nursed in the World War. So just I'll like toggle those memories back and forth between memory and present fantastic yeah this was a really good season i'm not, i'm not gonna lie there was a lot of and you're pointing to more depth now i almost feel like i have to rewatch it just to like go back and find the things that you're talking about that i didn't notice in the moment because i was just reacting the first time but there's I've watched this season a number of times and I did it again and and there's some episodes that I'll normally skip like around the miscarriage just because it's it's too tough to watch but I made a point so that we because we were talking about it it's like okay you've got to watch every single one and you do catch things it has incredible rewatchability oh mm -hmm. yeah there's a lot of layers to it and dealing with subjects that still hurt now PSD mm -hmm. PSTD miscarriage assisted suicide this hasn't changed you know what and that's what i like about how they're doing some of these subject matters that no one wants to talk about but we're going to throw it in your face in an artful way it's yeah. in a very human way i think too as i kind of said before when we were talking about the faith episode sometimes i feel like there are certain things that get a little sensationalized but i feel like in season one and season two, they do do a really good job of showing the kind of human cost that these traumatic events have on these characters that, you know, they're feeling thing these things. It's not all spectacle. And I think that's really important because if you're going to include these sensitive topics, you need to do it 
in a sensitive way. And I think at this point, they still, they, they definitely do. One of the things that you were talking about, the World War II and the battles, is she has to make decisions. And she had to in World War II. She has to go back in that mindset. I can do something for that one, but I can't for that one. We got to move on. And, you know, that's happening right now in hospitals, unfortunately. That's true. I really liked the Scotland half of this season quite a bit. I mean, the France the France half was, was very, very good, but the Scotland, I, I don't know, I liked returning to Scotland. It felt comforting in much the same way that it felt comforting, I think, to Claire and to Jamie to go back to Scotland. I was like, yes, we're back in Scotland, even though I know that war is coming and a lot of these people might just die in front of my face. Okay, but at least we're back in Scotland, and I, I enjoyed the storytelling and the pacing in that half of the season. It just, it felt very tight. It was very, like, one after the other after the other, building upon itself. All of the decisions and things that we were watching just felt really right for the story. I don't know, it might be the best half season that I've watched so far. Uh, no wasted moments. No wasted moments. They pack a lot in. Exactly. So I'm going to ask you some of the tying off questions so we can bring our season two episode recap and catch up to a close. The second season was actually critically rated more favorably than the first one. Compare and contrast, which do you prefer better, season one or season two and why? Oh, I don't. I know I said at the top of this gathering that I liked season two better than the first, but it almost feels an unfair comparison because so much of the first season is creating the foundational relationship relationships that pay off later so you can't have one without the other i definitely <laughs> agree with that that's very true so is it better to treat these as no i was hoping you were gonna <laughs> not notice that i didn't answer the question <laughs> how do you expect it's me one to not notice that? <laughs> fine I'll, I'll say i'll i'll stick with what i said when we started this that I liked season two better than the first. Just recognizing that it was so good because it started. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. That's a fair qualifier. <laughs> Jeez, Samantha. <laughs> I'm starting to sound like Kristen over here. <laughs> Learn from the best. It's just one long season. Just to picking up and continuing on. There, there was just a little break in between. Overall, probably season two would be... I would say it was better okay. because there's a lot of things that character development that you get. I think I'm going to stick with what I said at the top, that season one is my favorite season. It's the one that I always go back to when I rewatch. I normally don't rewatch like season two or season three without at least rewatching season one. I feel like that's, you know, it's the OG, it's the original. But yeah, season two does do a really good job of adding to that and going in new directions and introducing new characters. Like, it's all good. It's just, you know, when I'm sick and I need something familiar to put on the TV, I just generally go to season one. And Scotland, just wrap me up in a nice flannel. Like, I, I'm, I'm in fall mode. I'm thinking about fall and, like, wrapping myself in, in plaid. and Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. I think I would be one of those that I like season two better just because of the story arc. I love season one, but there is... It drags, I think, for some people because of all the character development. There's so much... That you have to, so much groundwork that has to be set. But sort of like Lori said, it really is one, one episode, one, one season that just, yeah, I, I, I like thinking of it as one whole season. You just sort of, you start in, in, in Scotland, you, you hit France for a slight arc, and then you come back to Scotland. It, it really does complete it nicely. It makes a nice story arc, if you think of it as one season. But you kind of get some of that if you just look at season two. But if I had to choose, season two would be my choice. Kristen, did you yeah. have a thought? Yeah, this is, it's definitely a hard one. I agree with a lot of things that other people have said. You know, especially Karen really hit the nail on the head where season one and season two feel like a complete... Story. I know that there are two different books, the way that she wrote them, but it feels like it's one complete arc. Season two has the slight edge for me just because there were more surprising twists, you know, starting off with the opener of Claire's already, just how they shot it, you know, the, the cinematography. Claire's already back in 
what was her present in, in the 1940s. That was a huge twist out of the gate. And then we see, you know, the little snapshots of her with a young Brie, it turns out, in Boston. But as a non-reader, I didn't realize that the pregnancy wasn't with Brie, that it was with Faith. When she has the miscarriage, that was gut-wrenching and shocking and a huge twist that I didn't expect. But there's that glimmer of hope because we've seen her with a child. That's very clearly Jamie's. You know, we have, you know, the France bit, which is beautiful. They go back to Scotland, which feels like coming home, which it should. I definitely got that. But then we have Fergus comes in, and I love Fergus. But then we have the losses of Colum, Dougal, and Angus leading up to the battle. And all of those were unexpected. I mean, you knew that the fight with Dougal was going to come to a head and that, you know, but actually watching that happen was still very surprising. Losing Angus was totally out of left field because he was fine, he was fine, he was fine, and then he was gone. So having those moments of goodbye and then closing out with Claire, going back through the stones, and but then there's that little bit of hope at the end that, oh, Jamie's still alive you know, 20 years on, I feel like it just perfectly closes out that first chapter of their story together. And then it will let us move into their future. Season two by hair. I definitely agree and see the argument that the first two seasons are really just one long story. I just think from a presentational aspect, season two probably is the better season for me. I mean, I love being in Scotland and I love the first season was very, very good. And I really enjoyed learning about everybody but I think there's just a real a real streamlined way that season two presents the story that just feels like it goes along at a good clip it's very relational and you're very engaged in it now we've hardly talked about the season finale and I want to mention that really quick because it had what I called a lost moment because she literally says I have to go back just like Jack said we have to go back and <laughs> together until now <laughs> it happened and so <laughs> and the whole finale was also an interesting I don't know if I want to call it a twist because I kind of know where things go from there but it's interesting that they start really they're starting the storytelling of the third season in this finale and we're we're ahead 20 years from where we started we've learned that frank has passed away we don't know how or why we just know that he's passed away they're in scotland to attend the funeral for the reverend who has passed away roger his adopted little son is now not little he's an adult he's and very hunky he's kind of cute oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> Looks good in a sweater. <laughs> Just saying. What more could you want? Right. And then we meet her daughter, who happens to be Brianna, and they don't explain prior to the moment that she was pregnant a second time with Jamie's child. So you're like, what? I thought this, was that kid a dream? Not a dream kid, I guess a real kid. Not the kid who was miscarried. Some other kid. <laughs> Who's kid? <laughs> so there's this whole business. Where did this child come Where from? Where did this child come from? And, you know, she's all American because she's lived in Boston her whole life. And there's this all this business. And then they start to go down the path of why are we here and who are we here? And wait, mom had an affair? What's going on with all this? <laughs> yes, it's so scandalous. But it's so, I mean, the two of them. Oh, my gosh. I can't think of what's his name. Richard Rankin in real life. Whatever Roger Wakefield. Roger Wakefield. Yes, Wakefield. thank you. <laughs> Roger and Bree are so charming the way they play off each other. And what this series does really well is the finale is always a springboard for the next season. So no matter how off the rails things have gone, and if you're thinking, oh, I don't know if I can keep watching this show because it's like you get into the depressing bits, they always bring it back. And it's like the final moments of every finale is, oh, I can't wait for the next one. Well, and that's what happens here because while they're while Brianna is trying to chase down the truth of 
mom because they're finding the clippings of when she comes back and the and the season premiere and you know lady comes out of nowhere after missing from two years and all this stuff hasn't been told to her so she's trying to figure out what mom is hiding at the same time they encounter gillian edgars aka gellis duncan before yep. she's gone back in time to be della's Gellis Duncan and she's apparently you know the pro Scotland liberators and talks about the Bonnie Prince Charles and all of this business and we actually watch her disappear into the standing stones at Craigna Dune because after her husband yes and also into some human sacrifice yes there's Another like, Bananas character. Yes! <laughs> All these layers get tossed in in like the final 30 minutes of this season, which is like, what is going on? <laughs> and maybe I'll get some answers about this time travel. Will somebody tell me the answers? I'm hoping it's coming. They don't tell me the answers there. So what did we think about that season finale? I mean, clearly you've got the strong opinions. Samantha already said it made you want more. It certainly made me want more. Oh, I was yeah. like, I have to go back to Claire. <laughs> <laughs> having all five seasons on stars right now i didn't have to wait zach and i kept watching now i have watched a little ahead i may be two or three episodes into season three so i do i mean i don't know what happens because that starts in a different spot too but i at least know where where they want to take the next season it's so good they're very good at dangling things yes. oh gosh, dangles it's insane Yes. It's like, I feel like, I feel like a cat with a toy. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'm going to catch it. Oh, and then it's, over, it's over here and it's like out of my reach and they've got something else. And it's like, oh, yeah, I remember the first time watching like season two ends, you know, in this very like, oh my God, place. And then season three comes back and in a different place. And you're just like, wait, like, come on, you guys. It's like, like it, it takes me for a ride. They the always Cool, though they always make the loop back and, oh yeah you know it's like I've started even especially during season three I watched the recaps in the beginning normally I would skip through them when I was binging but there's little nuggets that they pick up and they pick up and they pick up episodes later a season later and it's just masterful I've been trying to watch the recaps because when they do do the recaps they're giving you a little bit of remember when this happened yeah you need to you need to know this right now <laughs> so skipping those is to my detriment I have figured out and see being a lover of the books I'm going oh in this season I know what they're gonna hit on and season three introduces one of my favorite characters so I'm excited to have that addition and trauma with him oh boy she says trauma oh no a different style of trauma okay i want to try to figure this out so hmm. i know I, i've <laughs> yeah, seen now it i'm like who i, I know who it is <laughs> <laughs> i know who it is karen's na 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 boo booing us <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that's i'm not gonna say because that would be a major spoiler it would be but there's Going back to the brilliance of writing, I put Gabladon and George R. R. Martin in the same boat because they leave nuggets and research her more than him because it's a fantasy world for Martin. But the storytelling and when they said they were going to do this show, I was actually very worried because I love the book so much that they wouldn't do it justice. But so far in the first two seasons, they have proved me wrong. Because normally I'm a all book all the way. And Gorgeous Men of Scotland. Always a good thing. Can't forget that. Always a plus. Being a reader, my usual take at the end of each season is, but wait, that doesn't happen in this book. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't happen till next season. That but, I get, uh, but you know, I've accepted flashbacks forward, back, and all over the place yeah. to hit the books because I'm not a fan of the second book. I don't like the second book, but it works for me. I can overlook some story alterations and whatnot yeah. so far. The third book is one of my favorites. Yes, mine too. Oh, hi, Billy. All right. Well, the only other thing that I think I would mention, we, we talked a little bit about some of the real life figures being Prince Charles Stewart, the Comte Saint-Germain was real, Lord Lovett, Simon Fraser was real, but William Gray also pops up in this season. He was a real-life dude. You know, the one no, he doesn't. 
No, he's fictional. He's fictional? That's not what I my research told me. Really? Lord John Gray is a fictional character. Yeah, he's a conglomeration of several real characters, but no, yeah. he's... The one that tries to kill Jamie while he's taking uh, you-know-what, and then... Yep. Uh, okay, all right. I'll go, I'll look into that a little bit more. Did we want to talk about these? I think we did a lot of talking about how they portrayed them fictionally, but do we want to hit anything on this? Well, I think the guy who played Fr Fraser Lord Lovett did a, a masterful job of portraying him as the a-hole that he was. <laughs> no, I think they've all done a, a marvelous job. It's historically accurate that Ronnie Prince Charles did not live in a real world because he was so isolated as a child, and that isolation pretty much followed him all the way through till his death. And so he was quirky, as the French were <laughs> during this time period. This, mm -hmm. Even though he wasn't French, that's yeah. what he grew up in. If you're interested in the British-Scottish family dynasties at all, the Stuarts are just a marvelous family to look into as a general rule. <laughs> Because they're all very, I mean, Mary Queen of Scots was a Stuart, you know, James I was the first Stuart king on the throne after the Tudors, after Elizabeth died, and he's got a little bit of history with him. I just think, I, I like to read about all of the family dynasties, but the Stuarts are so embroiled because of the fact that they were Scottish to start. They come into England and everything is a whole business. I highly, highly, highly recommend reading into them if you haven't taken a deeper dive because it's just, it's like, it reads like a soap opera even though it's history. So <laughs> They're all bananas. Bananas is a strong fruit to use for all of them. But the guy that we're talking They're about... They're a bunch of bananas. <laughs> You know, in another family is the Italian family, the De Amici's. Woo! You want to talk about a family? Look into that family. They are the crown jewel of family intrigue. They put the Stuarts to shame. Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> if you've never heard of the De Amici's, they're they're interesting. Popes, kings, queens, the whole shebang. Okay, so I guess the question I have to leave the readers with, after season two, although I kind of already know what your answer would be, would you recommend Outlander to others? Why or why not? Yes, ma'am, because of the past two hours. Oh, has it been? Has it been two hours? <laughs> <That was vision>. <laughs> <laughs> If you've made it this far into this podcast episode, I think you know why we would recommend this season. <laughs> yeah, I think I think if you have watched along this far in Outlander, you you know why we would recommend it. It does have a very specific appeal, but that specific appeal can apply broadly, which we'll talk about more later on, I think, because there's stuff that I'd be foreshadowing that I can't fully flesh out beyond a foreshadow. Dun dun dun. Mm -hmm. So before we sign this this lengthy discussion off, is there anything else you want to say about season two of Outlander? Again, great costumes, great music. Bouton and Fergus are my heroes. Which who and Fergus? Bouton and Fergus are my heroes. Okay. Bouton? It's a season full of MVPs, but my my personal picks. Anything else? It's just a delightful season to watch. It's a, a beautiful story arc and very, very satisfying to watch. That's true. That's the best praise you really can give for a season of TV. It was very satisfying to watch. And I think that's the note we're going to leave it on. So at this point, what I'd like to do is thank Kristen, Samantha, Anna, Laura, Lori, and Karen for joining me once again to talk about Outlander Season 2, but you know, this is a five-part catch-up series. There are more seasons on the way. Before we can get there, though, it's time for the credits. Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation Point was produced by Back Pocket Productions, run by yours truly, the Chief Couch Potato, which is really another way of saying executively produced by me, Kylie Piet. My associate producers are Krista Pennington and Celine Resmer. I edit this podcast, and our logo is by Rebecca Wallace. Our marketing graphic artist is Krista. Our theme song was written by Sarah Milbratz and sung by Sarah, Amy McDaniel, and Kels Resmer. Kels played the keyboard, Ian McDonough played the bass, Christian Somerville played the guitar, and the whole shebang was engineered by Kyle Aspinall and Christian. 
we hail from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Please, if you like what you hear, take the time to rate us, give us stars, provide comments, or review us wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, CastBox, and Amazon are just a few of the places you can find us, but we're also on YouTube. We have our website, and we're now on Patreon at patreon.com slash couchpotatoesunite. If you really love us, pledge your support by becoming one of our United Couch Potatoes as we grow our little sofa-populated corner of the world. Otherwise, feel free to tell us how we're doing, what we should add, subtract, keep, or toss. You know how it goes. And if you have suggestions for shows we might consider, contact us at our website where we have a guest book, by email at couchpotatoesunitepodcast at gmail.com, our Facebook, our Twitter at CPU Podcast, our Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite, our Patreon, or wherever you get your podcasts. Though, of course, we add new and old shows to chat about around the water cooler all the time and always have new episodes coming down the pipe. Just listen to our intros. If you miss old episodes or want to know in general what shows we cover, just search for us. Find us wherever you do searchable things on the internet. Don't forget that exclamation point. Or contact us via our website, our email, our social media accounts, and our Patreon to stay up on all the new events and episodes by our humble little podcast, Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point! Until the next time, the first three seasons of Outlander are available to stream on Netflix, while seasons four and five are available through a subscription to Stars, their app, or their add-on to outlets like Amazon Prime. In the meantime, our Outlander panel will next reconvene very shortly, in fact, to talk season three and episode three of our five-part catch-up series. So until next time, until next episode, new episodes are published every Wednesday. Keep listening, keep watching, stay tuned! Bye! 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 Bye. 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 Bye.